Today we're going to be talking about the Paradigm 40B. These speakers were loaned to me by a viewer. Give them a quick shout out. Leave them a comment. Say thank you, viewer. Uh, these retail for about, I have to look real fast, $2,400 per pair. And I'm going to walk you through some quick specs while I show you a little bit of a video of these speakers in my living room. The tweeter is a one inch Almac ceramic dome with a oblate spheroid waveguide. The mid base driver is a six inch ultra high excursion Almag cone with perforated phase aligning lens. Weight is 25 pounds or about 11 kilograms per speaker and they come in a variety of colors. As you can see, the pair that I was loaned is in a darker red color, but you can see that they also come in a variety of colors. Personally, I think it's a good looking speaker and the build quality seems to be pretty far up there. It's got nice speaker plugs on the back and the overall aesthetic to me is pretty nice. A few things off the top, when I talk about distance from the wall, this is what I'm talking about. When I talk about angling, this is what I'm talking about. And room size, this is roughly what I'm talking about. When I first fired these up, I had the speakers brought out about three feet off the wall. Uh, there were some resonances in the room that just kind of bothered me and I used EQ to tame some of them down. And after doing that, I continued to listen. And what I noticed in the very first track that I critically listened to with these playing, there the snare was just off. So I expect with this track, the snare is going to hit pretty hard. It's going to sound full. It's going to have a nice attack to it, but it didn't have that. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. I'll, I'll, you know, maybe I'll check into that in a little while. I continued to listen and I didn't notice that same issue as prevalently <laughs> as I did with the initial track. But what I started to notice more was that there was a crispness to the high frequency. Now, nothing in the high frequency itself stood out, meaning that, you know, sometimes we'll talk about sibilant standing out. That's around like four to six K typically it can be a little bit lower, can be a little bit higher, but four to six K is kind of that sweet spot. I didn't notice that with the speaker. So it was all kind of moot, really. The mid range itself sounded good, but I continued to kind of waffle between, I don't know if it's the upper mid range or if it's the high frequency, but something is not right to me. After doing my listening, I conducted my measurements and I went and looked at the results and I'm going to share those with you in a little bit, but suffice it to say what I heard can be pretty readily pointed out in the data. Now, as far as positioning and setup and things of that nature go, put them parallel with the wall behind the speaker, fire them straight out into the room. When you do that, it's going to tilt down that high frequency shelf a little bit, certainly in the direction that you first hear the sound come from. But when you factor in the room reflections and things of that nature, the difference between pointed directly at you and pointed off axis is about two decibels, give or take. That difference is enough to make this speaker sound quite a bit different. When pointed directly at you, the high frequency for me was just too much. And I definitely preferred them when they were pointed out into the room. The relationship between the aiming and the distance to the side walls certainly plays a factor here. But generally what I notice is that the trade-off between having the speakers pointed directly at you versus towed out is when they're pointed directly at you, you get more imaging precision. There's more focus of instruments and singers within the sound stage. When you tow them out, you lose some of that precision in most cases, but you gain width. So there's that trade-off there. And certainly when I towed these speakers out a little bit more, I gained width, but it sounded like some of the imaging precision was lost in the stereo effect. While this speaker doesn't really extend low, and I would say probably about 60 hertz in the room, what it does have is high-ish sensitivity. We're not talking pro audio sensitivity, but for most consumer bookshelf speakers that use conventional cone and dome drivers, this has sensitivity that's a little bit on the higher side at around 88 decibels at 2.83 volts, one meter input. You also gain low distortion and low compression. Now, in my opinion, the fact that this speaker has a little bit higher sensitivity, the low distortion and low compression doesn't necessarily mean that it's intended for home theater. But when you complement that with the fact that the extension isn't really low and you probably are going to want to have a subwoofer with these, then I think it makes more sense as a home theater speaker, maybe your mains or maybe even your surrounds. For full range hi-fi type listening, 
probably not the best way to go because you're just, in my opinion at least, you're giving up too much of that lower end mid bass. Now, again, if you have a subwoofer, then you're going to be fine. But I think this speaker may probably is more beneficial for the home theater person who is knowingly going to have to have a subwoofer anyway. But if you are a hi-fi enthusiast and you don't want to add a subwoofer, then you'll want to look for something that gets a little bit lower in frequency. And I would aim for something that gets maybe 40 hertz in depth because if not, most of the music that you listen to is going to have content down to that region. Rap is going to extend lower for sure. And then some music is going to extend lower, but 40 hertz and up typically captures the majority of genres of music, but 60 hertz and up, you're going to be missing too much of that mid bass thump and that kick drum. When I push these speakers closer to the wall, I actually like the sound more. I think some of that may have to do with the fact that they're starting to roll off a little bit sooner, but also certainly some of that had to do with the fact that I was catching some nasty room modes. And when I did not use EQ to bring those down, it was almost just too annoying. Now, this is interesting because what it does is it shows us a couple things. One is as a listener and as a reviewer, doing the subjective portion of your listening, not just me, but you as well, you've got to consider what's going on in your room. Placement in the room relative to where you are, those things drive the bass response, mid-bass response as well, and how you hear what you hear. So you have to consider that aspect as a listener. The other thing that might have contributed to this is that these speakers have a little bit of a bump around 120 hertz. And again, we're gonna see that in the data too. Now, typically I like that. I like a little bit of an extra kick. The reason for that is because about 50 hertz is the fundamental for most kick drums, You're 40 to 60 hertz, somewhere in that region. So your second harmonic is gonna be around 100 hertz, give or take, right? And it's really just the fundamental times two. That's how you get your second order harmonic. What I've noticed through all my years of tuning different systems and things like that is that Usually I'll go in and pepper a little bit of about a decibel or two around 120 Hertz to give me a little bit more of that sound of the kick drum. Not necessarily the impact of the kick drum, not the fundamental, but the sound of that impact. So that's a personal thing. Before I get into the data, I wanna do a couple things this time. I talked about how the snare missing attack and detail was probably the first thing, well, it was the first thing I noticed about this speaker. So I have taken a track of a snare and I have convolved it with what the response of this speaker is. So I'm gonna play you the original snare track and then I'm gonna follow that up with the convolved version, which has what essentially that sound would be through this speaker, okay? What I want you to listen for is to see if you notice a difference in the attack and clarity from the original snare to the convolved response of the snare. If you don't notice that, then maybe rewind it and listen to see what you do notice. Now, here's the thing. You may notice the attack or clarity missing, or you might notice that the high frequency is maybe a little bit too boosted. Now, certainly me telling you what to listen for is kind of leading you into it. That's fine. I've also got data, so I don't really care about that. I really am trying to help you understand what I'm talking about when I'm describing the sound of this speaker. And I'll also follow up with some pink noise shortly after that to give you an idea of the overall sound. But I wanna use this snare specifically because again, it's the first thing that I noticed. Now let's go with the pink noise. We're gonna play the pink noise and then the convolved response, a couple iterations, and just listen for the overall timbral balance. Now that you've heard all of that, Let's look at some of the data and see if we can make sense of why you heard what I heard and why maybe even what you heard may differ from what I heard. First of all, all the data that you're about to see is captured captured, captured using the Clippled Near Field Scanner. It is a state-of-the-art robotic device 
that allows me to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic room. And certainly you don't listen to speakers in a non-anechoic room, but what this does is it allows me to baseline the performance of this speaker against every other speaker that I review so we can make meaningful comparisons and we don't have to rely on our auditory memory. Starting off, we're gonna look at the frequency response on axis when the speaker is pointed directly at you. You can see that you've got a lot of issues going on. We've got some diffraction dips around two to three K. We've got another one around seven K. We've got a little bit of a boost, but then if we go to the 30 degrees response, most of that is kind of filled in. You still have something going on around five K. So that's a different sort of edge diffraction it looks like. And the reason I say that is because this listening window response in green is higher than the on axis response. So we know that the energy going to the side of the speaker or even above the speaker is higher than the energy coming directly out of the speaker, okay? That's that's a quick, quick telltale sign for that. Average sensitivity at the 30 degrees off axis is 87.2, and then if you looked at the on axis, it's 88.4. Now that's simply how I calculate it. I take the mean from 300 hertz to three kilohertz. The F3 is at 67 hertz, F10 is at 43 hertz, and the CEA 2034 data set on axis looks like this, and then 30 degrees looks like this. So a more neutral speaker when towed out off axis and much better directivity. And that's another thing I forgot to mention. This speaker has good directivity, which means that we can pretty much EQ this thing to fix some of the audible issues that I had. And I'm gonna provide you with some suggestions, suggestions for that in a little bit. Man, I am tongue tied. All right, let's keep going. The estimated in-room response at zero degrees pointed directly at you and then 30 degrees towed out and then I draw this line to give you an idea of how I heard the speaker. Now, this is an interesting case, and this is why I say what you heard in those sound clips may differ from what I heard. And not necessarily what we heard, but how we interpret what we hear. So I said that when I first listened to the speaker, the lack of attack in the snare was the first thing that stood out. But as I went through further tracks, sometimes it sounded like maybe the speaker was just a little bit too bright. And it wasn't so much the lack of attack, but it was just that there was too much treble. So this graphic right here indicates that, yeah, there's just too much treble. And it doesn't necessarily indicate that there is a lack of attack or clarity. You know, normally that would be a dip right through here. Now you got a little bit of one right through here, but I don't think that was really it. And the reason I say that is because I went to my EQ at 2.5K and just brought it up a bit. And then I went to 1K and I brought that up, but the biggest difference maker was 2.5K. If I brought that up about 3 dB, all the attack and the life was brought back into the recordings that I was listening to. And I thought that's more close to my reference that I use. On the top end of things, you may have heard the speaker sounded a little bit too sizzly, maybe a little bit too, what did I, what's the word I used here earlier? Crisp, crisp is another word. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the frequency response on the top end just kind of flattens out. That's because the speaker has good directivity. Because it has a flat on axis response, essentially at 30 degrees, well, flat 30 degrees response, and it has good directivity, that means that it's gonna flatten out in the higher frequency. That's very typical of wave guided or horn loaded type designs. And if you go back and look at some of Kef's speakers, you'll see that they have very good directivity and they purposely bring down the level of their tweeter enough to where you have a more smooth and linear in-room response like this blue line is showing. So keep this in mind when you're looking at my data and you're listening to my analysis of it because what I heard may be described differently than what you heard, but it's probably the same thing. We just describe it differently. Burst decay shows some mild ringing at about 2.5K. I think this is pretty good overall. There's Maybe this is the woofer kind of breaking up possibly, but Certainly no enclosure resonance or anything that screams that it's major trouble to me. Horizontal contour plot directly on axis at about plus or minus 60 degrees radiation width. But if I tow this guy out and look at the measurements at 30 degrees off axis, so this is where my dark black line is, this dotted line, you can see that the directivity actually looks better. It's still about plus or minus 60 degrees, but these little guys are less obtrusive, right? If I go back, you can see there's some significant flaring, again, diffraction elements and things of that nature. But if I go to the 30 degrees toe out, then this is much more smooth. More evidence for why this speaker makes more sense to listen to 30 degrees out, pointed out into the room, maybe 20 degrees, but I would not recommend aiming the speaker at your head. Vertical window is about plus or minus 20 degrees, so it's okay. Harmonic distortion at 86 decibels and then at 96 decibels, 
we're below 1% THD down to about 50 Hertz. That's good. Multi-tone distortion also looks good. So we increase relative to the fundamental at around 1K, but for the most part, this looks really good to me. If you add a subwoofer, not a lot of change, maybe a little bit less distortion in the mid range. And then finally, dynamic range. Overall, this looks good to me too, except for obviously you get down to the lower end and things start going haywire. That's why I say use a subwoofer, okay? And then impedance last, minimum impedance is about 3.5 ohm. Minimum EPDR, if you're using this with an AB amplifier, is about 1.8 ohm. There's no resonances showing up in the impedance, so that also gives us a good idea that the enclosure itself is pretty much problem free. Now, a couple of EQ suggestions, all right? And these are just suggestions. You don't have to follow them, but you might be interested in them. But both cases, I'm leaving this mid bass bump there because personally, I like it. In this case, I'm trying to strike the balance between letting the mid range droop and letting the high frequency kind of dictate the response, okay? So I'm letting that happen. That's this blue line, the, the targeted line. And then in order to EQ to that target, these are the parameters that you use. Now, my next option for EQ is to target more through this mid-range and capture more of that so you don't have to bring as much up. But in return, you're bringing the high frequency down. The difference between these EQ settings is that option one here is gonna sound more full, more lively overall, whereas option two is still gonna sound linear, but it's gonna sound darker overall. So that does it for this review. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, let me know in the comments section below. If you like this content, give me a thumbs up and hit subscribe if you haven't already. If you would like to support what I'm doing here, you can do so one of a few different ways. You can buy a t-shirt from my merch store. I think it's linked in the bottom below. You can purchase anything through any of my generic affiliate links like Amazon, Crutchfield, Best Buy, et cetera, et cetera. That's all in the description section below as well. Just click the link and then buy whatever it is from that store you wanna buy. And then finally, you can join me at patreon.com where I give some inside behind the scenes info. You can vote for what I'm gonna review next. And I do giveaways and stuff like that every now and again. That covers it for me. Overall, I'll quickly say, good speaker could use EQ, bit bright without it or missing clarity and attack without it. Needs a subwoofer to be full range. Don't necessarily recommend this for hi-fi or audiophile listening because it doesn't extend low enough, but for a home theater type setup where you're gonna be using EQ and you're gonna be using a subwoofer, I could recommend it. Okay, talk to y'all later. Peace.